Joining us now in the studio, it's a guy who I'm going to make a conscious effort not to refer to, refer to as Mohawk Guy. Crap, I did it again. You did it again. But back for Dowsy, everyone. <laughs> yeah. How you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Hi. And of course, joining us via Google Plus, the creator of Facebook's massively popular, I fucking love science group, Elise Andrew. And the host of Veritasium, Derek Mueller. Thanks for joining us, you guys. It's our pleasure. Hi. <laughs> it is a pleasure. And we have so many people watching today. So you better be on your game, all <laughs> of you. Uh, let's start with you, Bobek, uh, because we actually we met first over uh, Skype video because I was the first yep. to interview you That's after right. yeah. the Mars Curiosity rover landing. And people were just so excited, inspired by you. How has life changed over the past year? It's been good. I mean, I've been still busy working on the rover, of course, but at the same time, getting a lot of chances to do some outreach and talk to kids and everything like that. So that's a lot of fun for me. Uh, it's just kind of one of those rare opportunities. Yeah. What, what's the update? Because every few weeks, I feel like there's a story that some rock is found, some piece of sand is found, that thinks maybe there was water, maybe there was people, maybe there was life. What, what's the update? What uh, I saying? mean, the biggest update is that we're on vacation. Uh, <laughs> nice, congrats. Actually, no, what, what happened is that, you know, uh, no, so we've, we've had some really good science findings uh, recently. Most, most recently is that the, the water looks like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of fresh water that you might find on Earth. It has all these ingredients that could have supported life, so that's pretty exciting. Um, but this month we're actually on vacation because Mars moves to the opposite side of the sun. Yeah. So we can't really talk through the sun. And so uh, in the meantime, the rover is just sort of busy doing its own little thing. We gave it some guidelines for the next month or so, but mostly we just uh, get to relax a little. Which it's is like great. A being a parent and letting your child go and this not is, know what it's, this is it's that doing. Moment. <laughs> well, we'll hear from it every day. It'll just kind of like, it'll text us and just say like, I'm okay. Yeah. And that's it, like it, basically the bare minimum. The but, text will go through the sun? <laughs> The text actually, you know what it does? It goes through one of the orbiters at Mars, and then that gets beamed back to us. So Interesting. Yeah. Why does it take forever to travel there and for eight and a half months for it to fly there, but you can get communications so fast? Well, it still takes 20 minutes for the speed of light between us and, and Mars, so it's, it's still a while. Um, we just don't move at the speed of the light yet. That's the, the problem. I'm working mm. on it. You, are you, you need to work on that. Gym. Thank you. So I want to go to Elise and Derek, who both are, you know, using social media to connect with people in a bigger way around science. Um, Elise, you you made news recently because you built a huge following on Facebook um, with "I fucking love science," and people were surprised that you were actually a woman. Why do you think people were so surprised? I I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're like, why the hell would they care, right? Well, yeah, that was my reaction. I mean, I never made a secret out of it. I never made a big deal out of it. But suddenly, when everybody found out, it was a huge deal. And I have no idea why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like there's this generalization around like science. Like, it's, it, is it a male-oriented thing? It's kind of like technology where um, there's fewer females. I mean, is there still that idea that there's more, it's a male-oriented industry? Well, I gotta say yes. I mean, I, well, I think there's, there's still a little bit of that stigma. I don't think it's actually that true. I mean, yeah. if you looked at even our landing room, there were quite a few women in there that night, and there's still a lot of women who work on, on the, the project today and everything, and, and at, at JPL and NASA in general and, and in science. I just yeah. think that it's, you know, it's kind of like in the same sense that like, people weren't were surprised by a Mohawk. I think people are just not up to date necessarily on what science and engineering looks like nowadays. Yeah. And it's, it's increasingly women, which is great. Um, it's increasingly people that you wouldn't necessarily on the street realize are scientists and engineers. Which I think that's so exciting because it's inspiring so many people through things like Mar Rover or, Mar Mars Rover or um, your Facebook page, at least, or what you're doing, Derek, on YouTube, that young people can get involved and inspired. Um, Derek, how do you feel like you're using YouTube to connect with people about the world of science? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, I just go out there and I, I put out the greatest science stuff that I can. Um, and if that connects with an audience, then I'm all the better. And uh, recently, we've, we've been doing some experiments that I think are really, really connecting. Yeah. Uh, and but can you really teach science in like a two-minute video? Is that the future well, of of uh, these this education? I've been going for more like five or ten minute videos because okay. I think you do need a little bit of time for people to learn. But um, I think it is possible and I actually spent my PhD, so about three and a half years of my life studying how to make a good educational video about things in science. Oh wow. And I found, I found that it's not just as easy as saying the correct stuff because a lot of people are doing that. A lot of great teachers you know, can tell you the right stuff. The right stuff is on Wikipedia. What you need is, is um, 
sort of more context. And, and a lot of people come to science with these preconceived ideas and it's hard to change them. So you've got to start there, which is why I get out to the street a lot and talk to people on the street about what they're thinking about science. And then I sort of d discuss it with them and I show them some experiments and we come around to the correct conclusion. And I think that's really a powerful way of learning. Yeah. People in the chat room want to know, want us to be talking more details about science. So let me ask you, what do you guys each think about what do you think will be the next big breakthrough in science, the next big discovery, whether it's from the Mars rover or just in general? I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily a breakthrough, but I think this is the year where we're going to see some big announcements, um, certainly on like Earth-like planets outside of other stars. I think that's the thing that, you know, within mm -hmm. the next year or two, we're going to see a lot of it. We're going to realize that, that there's a lot of these kind of planets, whether they support life or is it, you know, it's kind of its own question. But that you'll see planets that could support life, um, even you know, in many other places. And I think that's pretty amazing. But aren't they all seen, they've been discovering a lot of them recently, but they're all so far, right? They're, they're definitely far, um, and you know, we're, we're still trying to understand the context, right? You know, it, can you have a much larger planet that supports life, for example, if it's still the right distance from the sun and everything else? So it's still looking at all those things. But yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is one of the big things that'll happen this year. At least you're uh, more into biology, as we all know. So oh, what is your take on that question? I think I I think the really interesting stuff is going to come about life somewhere else in the universe. I think we're going to find some traces of something. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be on Mars. I'm really excited for them to get out there and explore other bodies in the solar system, because I think there are more promising candidates in our own system mm -hmm. for life, uh, microbial life at least, and that's what I'm really excited about. I'm ex I'm excited for them to get on with that. I well, like, are there other planets you think we can land rovers on, or do you expect Def to find oh, proof of I mean, life on Mars? Well, you know, Mars is definitely, one of the great things about Mars is it's so much like our own planet, so it's, it's very interesting to us. Um, certainly today's Mars is not necessarily the best place for life, uh, but there are moons of Jupiter like Europa, for example, or, or the moon of Saturn Titan that look really promising. They have a lot of the ingredients. Europa is, I mean, it's just... It's this ice ball, but underneath this ice, what we think is this kind of liquid ocean. And you know, on Earth, where we find oceans, we find life. So it's really promising. It's really exciting. And I think you know, we'll, we'll see you know, NASA put an effort to, to get out to some of those places in the next uh, decade or so. I don't want to get too technical mm -hmm. with this No, question. but we want to. I mean, we have a lot of people that are very sure. into this. So. OK, then I will, because um, Peter Petrov asked a question. Hopefully, everybody can relate to it. Why is the Einstein equation equals mc squared, not e equals one half mc squared, like the Newtonian equation does for kinetic energy? Does question. Derek want to uh, jump in on that? And then we can get everyone I, I, I do kind of want to jump in. I mean, uh, uh, just about the next discovery, I mean, I am a physicist, uh, and so I am very excited, of, obviously, about the Higgs boson, which I think is sort of the discovery yeah. of, uh, of a century, really. Um, but as for the next breakthrough, I, I also tend to think it's going to come in biology. And what I'm quite excited about is is what's happening in genetics at the moment, you know, realizing uh, really that our previous models of, of, you know, one gene, one protein, kind of how, how bodies are built is not really how our, our systems work and that it's a lot more complicated than that. And figuring out, for example, the role of junk DNA and being able to sequence DNA much faster than ever before and much cheaper than ever before, I think this is going to open up a whole new field really in terms of you know how we're treating disease and mm -hmm. and how we understand our relationships to all the organisms on earth and I think you know that is the next uh, big breakthrough and what do you guys expect sorry, sorry, oh, no, I wanted to, we didn't even answer the e equals mc squared True. question <laughs> yeah well, you're oh, that's that. not my e yeah. equals mc squared question <laughs> well, well let, me ask, let me ask you about what you just said with regards to the Higgs boson right they supposedly have identified the god particle and it's the building block of life and what's been missing forever from our knowledge of our own DNA and what makes up humans, what is it going to lead to though? What do you guys expect the Higgs boson to reveal to us? I mean, it, it, well, it, fundamentally, right, it's, it's the building block for, for the atomic structure that we're trying to understand. What, what, what makes each of these elements in, in, uh, at the quantum level unique? Um, but I mean, I, it's I, certainly not my area of expertise. Well, I was, I was reading an article recently in Scientific American that was also talking about just the nature of space and how we've always thought that space is this like, is this you know fuzzy thing just like what we're used to, but that maybe at its tiniest levels, actually space is digital and it's information. Interesting. I, I have not heard that theory. That's a really <laughs> cool theory. No, I mean, there's all these I mean, um, fascinating theories about like, the universe that we live in, right? Yeah. Even whether it's a simulation at some level. Right. Uh, and I, I think that's so cool. I, it, for me, it's, like, it's just more of an intellectual uh, engagement. I don't necessarily know the answer to those things, and I don't think that you know, it's, it's, we're going to discover that in, in any time soon. But, uh, at the same time, it's really cool to sort of, un, you know, try to think about that and say, like, what, what does that mean for us as a, 
as someone Do you think with our there. fascination with space and people are now more interested in it than ever before? For some reason, because of the way we're connected to it? Like, are, is there gonna be more money in it? Is the government gonna care more about NASA and what they're doing? And pr there's now private, uh, the private sector yeah. of space and- Mars One, right? M uh, there's Mars One. Like Elon uh, Musk is doing interest, I mean, but that's more- There's definitely uh, a lot of private-, private travel. Well, lot Mars of private One travel. plans to have a colony begin on Mars within this the next 10 the, years, Yeah, so right? for those of you guys who aren't familiar, this is the Dutch company, they wanna do a reality TV show. <laughs> And of course. Of course. Well, Not I mean, in the name of gonna, science. In the name of reality. Funded, though, but right? that's the thing. They're going to make. I mean, this is how they're going to pay for this. this yeah, is right. that's true. Um, they're going to get the reality TV show. There's another one. Uh, Insp I think it's called Inspiration Mars, which is uh, launching. Uh, and uh, you know, they're saying in 2018 they'll do a flyby. It's a 501 day trip. Basically, you'll fly out to Mars and swing around the planet and fly back. They won't land. Right. And it'll be some married couple who is you know who's super rich. Do this. Well, no, they're not. I don't think they're oh, paying for it. I think it's funded uh, pri privately again. Um, but the, do you think Mars One will actually land people in a colony on Mars in ten years? I think that, I think those timelines are really ambitious. I mean, I, it's it's hard. I worked ten years on Curiosity. It's I know what it you know to some degree what it takes, and I'm sure that uh, private industry is is able to do things more efficiently or, or take some risks that we're not able to take. But uh, at the same time, I think you know short, these short timelines that people are sort of proposing are a little a little you know scary to me. Um, yeah. But you know, I, I wish them all the luck. I would love to see. I mean, that puts the pressure on us too at NASA to do. To do more things, and I think that's awesome. Let's go back exciting. to the chat room because we have like we have so many people in your our chat room. Brian Millar NASA. asks, "Why don't you start a hangout with the rover? Live YouTube stream from the Mars surface?" We could uh, we could probably not support that technically. So the um, we can we can relay data through the orbiters, but the you know we can't we can actually do video, but I think we'd have to actually downlink that slowly over the course of time. Yeah. But, and I don't know what you'd see, unless you caught like a dust devil or like, you know, something like that. It would it just would, look barren. It would look just like a, sti a still image. How, now obviously when, when NASA defunded its, its missions to the moon, right? And that the funding yeah. got shifted, how did that affect your guys' enthusiasm about the government wanting to fund science and wanting to fund explorations into space? And did it affect your guys' hopes to do new things in the future? Or? I think that, I mean, certainly you, you have to, you know, accommodate what the funding supports. And obviously, fr from the Apollo era to now, it's not the same. We think we were before something percent of the national budget. We're now less, less than half a percent of the national budget. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're looking at the era since then. We had, uh, the 70s had Voyager, two Voyager missions, which are now near the edge of the solar system. Had two Viking missions to Mars, which were first. So, I mean, we still accomplished quite a bit. We had a shuttle program throughout the 80s and 90s. Um, so I think that, that, that you know, we've been managing that, those resources pretty, pretty well. Um, and now we're, we're looking at you know, next generation humans, space flight. We have a series of Mars missions coming up for the next decade. Um, uh, you know, we're looking at mission studies for Europa and everything else. So, so you're going to be having a job for a while. I think I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I should, I hopefully <laughs> I have a job for a while. Uh, we actually have some questions in the chat room about, uh, from some folks. One, if someone has science education already, uh, what advice can you give them to getting their career started? And I, I want to go through some of the, uh, through, with Derek and then Elise if she hears us and then you. So Derek. So, uh, trying to get your career started in science education, I, I get a lot of emails about this because people or, say, you know, yeah. I, I, I want to know what tips can you give me. Um, I think the main tip is just get started. Um, I was talking to a group of students yesterday and showing them some of my early work and a lot of it is terrible. And you have to start somewhere and you're just going to grow from there. So the point is get going, get started. You know, I think too many people worry about it being good and being liked and uh, and so they don't do it, where the, the whole point is you need to jump in, you need to start doing things, and even if it's not perfect when you start, you know, you keep improving and you keep getting better. So the point is get it out there and have something where you can say, you know, not just I want to be a science communicator, I have this whole, you know, body of, of work that I've been making. And, and also that, for think, aspiring scientists too, I feel like, it, you, you know, to continue asking questions and learning, and there's so many resources like uh, YouTube channels like yours or what Elise is doing as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, I guess the point is getting yourself out there and showing your work and showing what you really can do. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing that anyone can do, really, to get noticed in their career. I, I mean, I really want to re reiterate what Derek just said, which is get started, get doing it. But once you have, be consistent about it, because there are so many people that that get started on a blog or a page or something, and then, and then they'll just stop. They won't get any responses. They won't get any fans. They won't get any any. And he likes, and then they'll just it's stop story and think it's not worth it. I can't be bothered. <laughs> but you need to keep doing it. You need to keep pushing out there, and eventually you will start to build up a following. And it will probably take a long time, mm -hmm. but you have to keep putting yourself out there. And even you can't let yourself get discouraged after a week or after a month. Oh, nobody's paying attention. 
They are. Keep going. Yeah. Elise, where would you love to see I Fucking Love Science go? Like, where do you see it in a year or five years? Oh, I've not. Everybody keeps asking me this question. Um, I've been asked to write a book. I've been, I mean, talks about a TV show. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing at the moment, which is showing people everything that I think is amazing and everything I think is cool. And that's really what IFLS is all about. It's all about finding the stuff that I think is amazing and showing the world. And I just want to keep doing that. And there are so many formats I can explore to do that. So I'm just currently in the middle of trying to pick which one. <laughs> Yeah, how do you know what's going to be popular? What are you seeing work in terms of content and building this huge Facebook community? I think it comes with practice. It comes very much with practice and learning what's going to be popular and what's not. But eventually, it almost becomes an instinct. I'm sure, I'm sure Derek has the same thing. You, know, you can look at an experiment and you can think, this is cool. People are going to like this. And it's just something that comes with practice. Is it basically what excites you? Like you see something and you say, oh, that's that's incredible and then you just know you know if it, if it twigs with you it's going to twig with others yeah absolutely what can people expect elise from you in terms of content and then in 2013 and, and trends we should all look out for i i don't know how much science changes from year to year if you're talking about what engages people more um it's always medicine and it's always astrophysics that's always what gets people excited but science doesn't tend to have trends necessarily in the same way i mean not the um in the same way the news does, because experiments and these things that, you know, they take a long time. Mm -hmm. The things that are coming out this year, they've been going on for the last three or four years. They're, you don't necessarily get trends in the same way. But people are always interested in astrophysics, people are always interested in medicine. So I think that's not something that's going to change anytime soon. I think that's a good point. And the president just announced a big, you know, uh, initiative to study the brain and, and understand and map the brain and right. everything else. So that's going to be, I think, you know, maybe not necessarily this coming year, but within the next couple of years, hopefully yield some really interesting results about how the brain works, which is, still kind of a mystery in some ways, um, and it's really cool. Do you think they're kind of linked in a way, you know, everybody says everything's a microcosm for everything, and the greatest reaches are sort of very similar to the smallest I think atom. that there will be some analogies there, definitely, like where you're going to see something like, oh, you know, we like learned this about this, and it's so much like the physical world or whatever right. uh, that we're, we're used to. There's another science question here on the chat room. Nobody09320 said, Bobak, we evolved under very specific gravity conditions. Do you think it's a good idea for humans to colonize Mars when our physiology is developed for a one gravity versus Mars 0.38 gravity. Yeah, I mean, that's always a good question. I mean, anytime we're moving to different environments, uh, but you could say the same thing about moving to cities, even on Earth. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily adapted. To the air is not great here in yeah, LA either. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's worth doing. I think that, you know, people will, will adapt. I think we'll learn to build the technologies and everything else that will help us to survive there. And that, that helps us with, you know, greater challenges in the future if you want to send people out to other further reaches of space or, or do whatnot, you need to sort of make the steps of, kind of like the smaller steps of, let's put it on a body that's not quite Earth, but you know, we have to develop some of the technologies and then maybe. Well, is it because, is, does it come from this fear besides curiosity that we all have as humans? Do we have a fear that we're not gonna be able to live on Earth at a certain point? Like, how I mean, realistic is so that? So far down the road, there is a place where we can't live on Earth, right? I mean, this is, but we're talking billions of years, not millions of years even. Um, also, but one, one benefit also, obviously, of being in a place with less gravity is much easier to maintain an erection. <laughs> I'm sure that's what he cool, thinks about. Right. We needed some, yeah. some jokes, just, I guess, in this, cool. in this discussion. It's a lot easier. <laughs> it's obvious. Now you're making him sweat even more than he's sweating. Um, I think that's all for this incredible discussion. We might, I think from the popularity of this and seeing the incredible response, we might try to do this more often. Just saying. Maybe bring in Bobak as a, a host of Science Day every Friday. That'd what do you fun. say, everyone in the chat room? Would you guys be watching that? Like, I'd, be... I'd watch that. I mean, <laughs> You're I like... That. <laughs> you would not be able to watch it. You would be live on it. Oh. Uh, so that would be okay, difficult yeah. for you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so that, that is all. Follow Bobak for Dowsy on Twitter at Tweets Out Loud. You can get your Mars fix anytime by visiting nasa.gov slash MSL. Thanks also to Elise Andrew. We love her. Find her on Facebook.com slash I Feeking Love Science. Or just look it up. I fucking love science. It's really easy to remember. And the amazing Derek Mueller science video blog is on YouTube.com slash One Veritasium. Check all of those incredible links out. Thank you guys so much. And to the incredible audience. Okay. We had to, it's, it's great to see on YouTube that people want to know more. Awesome. They care yeah. about knowledge. They care about information, education. We love that. Next, next week we have some awesome shows. Comedian Doug Benson will be here. YouTube cool. fashionistas Ellen Blair. And a performance from the Somerset and much more. Subscribe now to catch all that goodness. And subscribe because we'll have this video on our channel later today. So you can watch it again, share it with your friends, all that fun stuff. <laughs>